hello, hello allemaal and welcome. We are here today um, at the Holocast Educational Center at a very special exhibit. And I'm standing next to Nina Krieger, the executive director of the uh, Holocaust uh, Educational Center, correct? Yes. Right now, the Vancouver Holocaust Center has on view an exhibit called Enemy Aliens, the Internment of Jewish Refugees in Canada, 1940 to 43. And this exhibit tells a very little known story of Canadian history about the internment of about 2,300 German and Austrian Jewish refugees in Canada during the war. That's just fascinating. I, I looked around a bit and uh, I think we should walk around and maybe you can explain some of the things we see. Here's a um, remarkable case of documents that speak to the attempts to leave Germany and Austria. And these are visas, exit cards, and what this speaks to is um, all of those that didn't have these means of escape. And often these were the eldest boys of the family. And it's a challenging thing for us to encourage the students who tour the exhibition to um, think critically about the past and to not take historical uh, perspective, to take historical perspective rather to think about uh, how real the war hysteria was at the time and by imagining themselves in that time they can start to realize how the internment was possible how even though these uh, boys were German uh, Jewish refugees it was uh, because they were German nationals as well it was because of this that they were interned arrested and interned because of they were German nationals even though that they were Jewish refugees and had been through a variety of tribunals as well and here we have um, a suitcase and a backpack that belonged to Peter Oberlander, who became a renowned regional and urban planner of note in Vancouver and really across Canada. And this is the suitcase that he packed up when he was arrested in England, told he'd be taken to the police station for a few hours of questioning. And this is what he had with him. He took, ended up taking to Canada when he was deported and used actually after in Canada, after his release from internment in Canada. And I think. One of the remarkable things about this exhibit is how um, time sensitive it was. We were able to interview 16 of the former internees for the project. Um, had we undertaken the exhibition four years earlier, we maybe would have interviewed far more. Had we undertaken the exhibition six months later, it would have looked different still. Three of the former internees we interviewed during the, dur um, during the project passed away between the interviews and the opening of the exhibition. So and another interesting thing about this part of the exhibition is uh, there's symbols, barbed wire, even a suitcase that are normally associated with the Holocaust, which I think students and public audiences are not quite used to associating with Canada. And so in the interactive school tour, which is facilitated by um, very expert and trained docents, they encourage students to interact with, you know, is, is this what you associate with Canada? Um, and students have really interesting responses because on first glance an image of, of barbed wire might remind them of a Nazi occupied country, not uh, Quebec, New Brunswick, Ontario, the sites of internment. Now the heart of the exhibition is devoted to internee responses to their imprisonment. And we have remarkable, remarkable traces of creativity, the will to learn, these really pretty remarkable responses given the fact that they were imprisoned, freedom was denied, and there was a great uncertainty about their fate. And in this uh, context, they did remarkable things. And so in this case, we have uh, watercolors, uh, scenes of internment life created on scraps of toilet paper. So this reflects the material conditions of internment, the scarcity of materials with which to make um, these artworks and they're very quite somber solitary scenes of internment. Uh, I, th I think it's wonderful that you were able to put this at the right time really together. Um, so thank you very much for showing us around and giving us a glimpse of this and I certainly suggest if you live in British Columbia that you come and have a look at this exhibition because it's very very interesting. This 
program is sponsored by Dutch, the full-color English language magazine about the Netherlands and its people, at home and abroad. Canada to Leave is the online community for the Dutch living in Canada and the Canadians living in the Netherlands. Canada to Leave, wherever you live. This week we're dedicating the episode to Dode Herdenking and, uh, or as we say in English, Remembrance Day on May the 4th and as well Liberation Day, Bevrijdingsdag, on May the 5th. And we have some very special guests here today. We have Dr. Robert Krell and Mr. Bert Norden. Um, let me just introduce a little bit about them before we start our talk. Dr. Krell is um, survived the Holocaust as a child uh, hidden in Holland and became a noted child psychiatrist who uh, is very well recognized for his uh, special lectures and research in the psychological trauma uh, that Holocaust survivors and their children endured. Mr. Bert Norden uh, served in 1940 in the Dutch army uh, during the war in Rotterdam and he's also a survivor from the, I have to speak, speak here, Zwangenarbeit Lager, do I say that correct? Yep. Harbor labor camp in central Germany. Welcome to you both, welcome to Tulip TV. Really appreciate you taking out the time to talk to us today. I'd like to start with you. Um, you were hidden as a child in Holland. Where were you actually when the war started? And tell us a little bit of the beginning of the war. Well, as you know, May 10th was the day of invasion. I was not yet born. I was born on August 5th, uh, 1940. And uh, uh, obviously uh, the events of the first couple of years are out of my awareness, but as far as I was told, uh, the hospital had already, it was in The Hague, Holland, uh, the hospital, Zuidwald, had already been uh, uh, chosen by the Gestapo for one of its headquarters, one of the wings, had already become the headquarters. And uh, we, being a Jewish family, of course, went through all that has been uh, talked about and written about uh, with respect to uh, gradually being deprived of all our rights. I imagine uh, that was uh, somewhat tolerable because I've seen some pictures of me with uh, my parents uh, in those early years and we're looking well. And, and happy and then the world crashed. Uh, when we received our letter for uh, uh, deportation, uh, which wasn't stated as such at all, of course, it no, was resettled into the East and uh, we were to report on August 19th, 1942. So I was then just over two years old. Very young. Mm -hmm. Yes, difficult to remember. Probably at that age. Well, so. my memory kicks in very soon after that. At age two and a half, I begin to remember just about everything. Well, we'll talk some more about that in a minute. Mr. Norden, you were obviously a little bit older when the war started. Where were you when the war started? This program is sponsored by Dutch, the full-color English language magazine about the Netherlands and its people, at home and abroad. Well, I was in the army before the war, with the DGME troops, and uh, during the war we were stationed in Rotterdam, and then of course on <coughs> May the 10th the war broke out, and uh, May the 12th, I still remember that day very well, because there was a time when they were shooting down to the moor deck and the projectors, they were going straight over us while we were in, we were in the Java port by the Kralings the Plus and, and for the noise of the projectors going over, it was just uh, ear deafening. And just come out of the normal life and get dumped in like that, it's quite a uh, jolt. Yeah. And then of course, uh, May the 14th, we got a big bombardment and uh, <clears throat> I survived the bombardment and I came through it. And when I was over, I was in the crawling surplus. And then after that, of course, uh, it was only one day, and then we became 
so-called prisoners of war, which lasted till middle of July, and then we were released to be able to send home again, which was uh, really an exceptional. Yeah. Yeah. So, and from then on, of course, the normal civil life started again, but the, my life has completely changed. When I was going into the army, I was going to use my free time to finish my study. Well, of course, that was all in pieces that was not to be considered anymore. Right. So that was, those were the war days, and from then on, we had a long time, which we could talk a lot about what happened after that. And well, we'll go into sort of back and forth, because <coughs> you both had very different experiences during the war, different lives, oh, different generations ends. almost as well. Um, Dr. Krull, you were hidden in a house with uh, a family. You were separated from your own family. I imagine that that family almost became more like your own family because you were so young. How was that? that eventually, was yes. E eventually, yes. I mean, it was a, it was a series of miracles that, that happened because my parents decided not to report. Um, and uh, reporting meant uh, uh, going to Westerbork and from Westerbork to Auschwitz or Vot or Sobibork. Um, my father said that he'd seen his friends uh, report and not return. And so uh, uh, my mother uh, spent some time looking for a hiding place and I was placed with former neighbors in another part of the city who kept me for a certain time. And miraculously, uh, my mother to be walked in, Mrs. Munich, Violetta Munich, uh, was visiting them on her once annual social visit. And kind of obligatory mm -hmm. something. And she asked, uh, who's that? And I said, oh, it's Roby Kell, a Jewish, little Jewish boy, and his mother is looking to place him somewhere. She says, I'll take him for a couple of weeks. So kept me for two and a half years, so I became mm -hmm. part of the family. Of that yeah. family. I, um, I was watching some lectures that you gave, and one of the things, uh, that we, you talked about in the lecture was um, His Excellency Richard Sesberia, former ambassador of Rwanda to the U.S. stated once that memory is the highest and perhaps the most meaningful tribute one can pay to the victims of genocide. Memory is a very powerful thing. What are your thoughts on this? And I, I'm going to start with you about this. I feel we, yeah. the memories are there, it's part of history, and history is also for the next generation to learn from. And <clears throat> we should not uh, try to cover up what happened, we should not hold a grudge, but just the same, we should carry on and educate the next generation, be thankful and grateful that you live here, and look at the sacrifice which so many people have given to make this possible. Therefore, memory is part of history. It's a book, a textbook to learn from for the future. Absolutely. You agree with us, I think. Absolutely, of course. Yes. Of course. There is, there is nothing we have uh, left after such an event except our memories. And they are a warning to the future. Uh, had people remembered better, I'm very proud of of the Holocaust survivors that I know for having uh, spoken out and kept them alive. You, as a psychologist, have obviously psychiatrist. Psychiatrist, pardon, have worked with lots of survivors. It's very complicated. Survivors have been able to lead a normal life, but on a parallel track with their traumatic memory and and some actually very actively differentiate between those two because they will never rid themselves of memory. In fact, uh, uh, as a doctor to them, I certainly never had any expectations of, of cure or anything, but, but I would encourage them to uh, keep memory alive because even though some of those memories are absolutely horrendous, and tragic and awful, they often were the only memories they still have of family, 
person. And good days. So do you want to rid a person, make them a blank slate of some kind? No, you want them to encourage it. The Hunger Winter. You were still in Rotterdam or were you in the camps by the time the Hunger Winter in 1944, I think? This program is sponsored by Dutch, the full-color English language magazine about the Netherlands and its people, at home and abroad. Canada to Leave is the online community for the Dutch living in Canada and the Canadians living in the Netherlands. Canada to Leave, wherever you live. Home of winter did not affect me. I was very fortunate. In fact, uh, in a number of times, I brought some food to Amsterdam over the Eistelmeer. At my time, we were in, in a ferry and playing up the stuff. And it happened to be that I had a business connection there for movies. And so that's how we got in contact. And he said, well, then you, can you come over and bring some food? So we had suitcases full of potatoes and whatever. And that's how we got to Amsterdam. But I was living in the northeast part of, of Groningen. And the, that area, there was mainly farmers. And I had a lot of friends there. My parents were living right amongst those farmers. And in 1943, all the people had turned in the radios. And those radios were kept in moist locations quite often. What do you want to listen to? London, of course. Mm -hmm. And those radios, they all got little sick by corrosion. So and that was, since I was able to fix those radios, so... You were a popular man. <laughs> I was in demand, and sometimes, I still remember one time I was working on the radio, on the floor, and there was a whole opening in the floor, there was a butcher shop, and the SD people came downstairs to check for people in there. It was kind of a minute that I was sitting there, holding my breath. But anyway, that's... That's one reason that we had always plenty of food in our, in our place, mm. so it did not affect us. Your books educate a, a bit on that, also obviously go um, more about um, the psychological trauma, I imagine. I haven't read it. Can you mm -hmm. tell us some about the book? Um, this is a book, and Life has Changed Forever, Holocaust Childhoods Remembered. It's a collection of... Uh, I recall about 24 stories of Jewish children who experienced the Holocaust at different ages. And so I wrote about memory with respect to their age group. Interesting, definitely. We're in, by the way, in the library of the Holocaust Educational Center. And people in Vancouver can come and take out a book here if you're more interested in learning some more about the war and the past. I want to ask you, you were in the Zwang Arbeit Lager harbor camp, hard labor camp. <laughs> it was that not was by choice that I was there. <laughs> I was in the later part of 1944 and the SD uh, got hold of me because I was delivering dynamite uh, to the underground and uh, I built a few transmitters to stay in contact with London. And for some reason, somehow we had a meeting and there must have been a mall in that meeting because they got hold of me and they were trying to get me. And I also was the captain of the uh, Technische Noodhulp um, for, in the fire department. And uh, and I knew that they were looking for me, I av avoided. So then finally to get me, they put in a false air alarm in the city of Groningen. They knew I would go to the center there because that was my post and that's why they were waiting for me to cast me in. So I was in jail for a number of months, hearings and hearings, and while in the jail, quite often people were called out and they didn't come back. So I don't have to tell you what happened to them. And one day towards where there was a movement in Normandy, they emptied that jail, which was called House of Bewaring in, on the Heerenstraat in Groningen. And they emptied the whole jail, put them in, stay in cars, freight cars, 
locked the doors, and we were shipped into Germany. And we landed over in Langenstein. And there was a work camp, a little work camp outside, and that's where we were put in. And I was very, very lucky, because I was there a very short time, and the work that we had to do is put up splitter walls on a 45 degrees angle to the walls to protect the, the factories and so if a bomb would fall they would not destroy the factories. So after a few days we even the guards stayed behind they didn't even come along and we just went with the foreman if I may call him like that and to tell us what to do. And you won't believe it that foreman he was saying, when we were doing something, immer langsam, immer langsam. We were looking go slow, for the go end. Slow. Yeah, yes. Go slow, go slow. Mm -hmm. he, because he was looking to the end of the war. Right, right. And he befriended me with a restaurant owner who had a radio which could not receive short wave, that was sort of a boat. So I modified the radio so he could listen to London. Oh. During the time that I was walking around as a person who was supposed to be in that war camp. That was of course oh, yeah. just the last couple of weeks of the war, just before the war. So that was actually, I was, let's say, blessed that he sent me out to the camp. He didn't call me out on myself to be shot. So the you camp was man. my life life. Now we're talking the end of the war, Liberation Day. What does freedom mean to you? This program is sponsored by Dutch, the full-color English language magazine about the Netherlands and its people, at home and abroad. Well, unfortunately, uh, liberation for Jewish uh, children and, and obviously the, the adults even more so it was not, no not very liberating. Uh, in my individual case, my particular case, uh, I had come to know the monks as my family, and I was uh, basically given away once again. So uh, uh, I protested and, trauma, yeah. and went back to my parents, uh, realizing soon, of course, how lucky I was because my my only surviving cousin, his parents, did not return. So you know, it was a stark contrast in our family. But but liberation wasn't liberating. I know it must have been well, here. Maybe oh. for Mr. Norton, what it was like for Dutch Christians to return to their families. We no longer had one. Yes. We no longer had a family. Yeah. So my parents, uh, my parents who were only in their you know, late twenties, about thirty or so, uh, uh, their parents had been murdered. Their brothers and sisters had been murdered, and you know, we were the only three left. So difficult. I noticed you brought something along. Can you tell us something about this? Uh, yes, well, this is a document um, of um, gratitude to the people who uh, saved me, uh, and they're they're uh, written up as plechavis, uh, which is like foster parents, and strangely enough, to me always uh, not by name, but they were not named, named here, <laughs> uh, and signed by me, Bobby Kell. And it shows another mystery to me, November 1942 uh, to the 22nd of May 1945, when I was with them. Mysteries there are that uh, we looked for hiding places prior to August 19th, found one for me for a couple of weeks, so I am told. Right. Uh, where was I? September, October, November. I don't know. And I asked my mother and she says, uh, I can't tell you because I was in shock those mm -hmm. days. Uh, I suspect I was in many places for a while, but I just uh, don't know. So. Almost a lesson that you were that young. Still. Yeah. Yes. Uh, perhaps, but, but no, separations take hold. So, uh... 
Well, I want to thank you both very much for taking your time out to talk to us and, and go through these very difficult memories. And it is because of people like you that we can educate our younger generation and hope we can prevent these horrible events in the future. So I thank you very, very much.